But welcome to the beautiful McKnight Center. I don't know how many of you were here last weekend, but uh, for not, well, not last weekend, the weekend before, uh, for the fantastic uh, concert. But uh, this is a wonderful facility, and I want to thank Billy and Ross McKnight again and again and again, as well as all the other donors. Uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsors for the day. Uh, first of all, we have, uh, and I saw the Dean of Engineering, Architecture and Technology here in the Allen Scholars Program. I want to thank them, the Spear School of Business Scholars and Leadership Program, and the President's Fellows. I don't know who they are, but, uh, <laughs> but I, you, I'm sorry. I, if you're a President's Fellow, I definitely know who you are. Uh, by the way, during, during uh, the talk, as well as uh, afterwards, you can actually text uh, and we're supposed to have a slide up here that'll give you the, uh, the number. You can text that, you can text a question. We're very high tech here and it'll come uh, to my iPad, it, like magic. And, uh, and so if you have a burning question, just uh, send it on uh, at that, at that uh, whatever that is. <laughs> uh, of course, Winston Churchill was uh, one of, if not the most significant figure of the 20th century. Uh, he's a true and most studied and quoted individual, even some quotes that I'm not sure. Uh, he, uh, he was also, I'm sure he would tell you he's very proud, uh, that he was the grandfather of our guest today, Celia Sands. Thanks to our friend Linda Duncan, who is a true Okie from Muskogee, uh, first Cowgirl Anne and I had the great pleasure of meeting Celia this summer in London. Uh, after a delightful lunch, we invited Celia to come to OSU, and thankfully she accepted. Celia Sands uh, is the daughter of Churchill's eldest child, Diana. Uh, she's an internationally acclaimed author, journalist, television presenter, speaker. She has published five books uh, on various aspects of uh, Winston Churchill's life. Her most recent is uh, We Shall Not Fail, The Inspiring Leadership of Winston Churchill. It looks at his role uh, in defeating Germany, Nazi Germany in World War II. Another book entitled uh, Chasing Churchill about her travels with her grandfather, uh, which was made into a documentary that first appeared here in the United States on PBS. Uh, Celia is here to share her insights from her years of traveling with her grandfather at the end of his extraordinary life. Uh, and uh, we are fortunate uh, to enjoy Celia's unique perspective on the incredible life of Winston Churchill. Uh, after the talk, we'll have a question and answer period. That's why we have the little living room set up here. But for now, please give a warm welcome to, Oklahoma, a warm welcome to Celia Sands. Well, good evening, everyone. Wonderful to be here with you all, and thank you so much for coming. I can't believe there are so many people here. I feel very flattered. The only time I've ever spoken to more than there are in this hall was once in Japan, when there were 2,000 people. But I was being, it was done through an interpreter, and I looked around when I was speaking and saw only four people understood a word I said. <laughs> so I hope you'll all understand me. I'd like to thank President and Mrs. Hargis for their wonderful invitation to come here, Linda and Peter Duncan for introducing me to them, and I hope that I've made a lifelong friendship. And also to Melissa Meredith and Monica Roberts for all that they've done, and everyone else who has worked so hard to make this possible. I'm very honored to be speaking in your wonderful new auditorium so early in its existence and absolutely delighted to be with you all. Today, I'm going to try and tell you a little bit of what it was like to grow up with the most famous man in the world. When ears were deaf and tongues were mute, you told of doom to come. When others fingered on the flute, you thundered on the drum. When armies marched and cities burned, and all you said came true. Those who had mocked your warnings turned almost too late to you. Then doubt gave way to firm belief, and through five cruel years, you gave us glory in our grief and laughter through our tears. 
when final honours are bestowed and last accounts are done, then shall we know how much was owed by all the world to one. That is how millions of people, both in Britain and here in the United States, regarded Winston Churchill in 1945. People often ask me, what is my favorite memory of my grandfather? For me, that's an impossible question. There are so many. I only knew one of my grandfathers, so I quite naturally assumed that every grandfather was exactly the same as him. <laughs> if I'd had to describe a grandfather, he would have been a loving and much loved man, puffing a large cigar with everyone, secretaries, colleagues, family and friends, all running around trying to make life as comfortable and easy for him as possible a man with endless knowledge and many interests, who recited poetry, made people laugh, loved animals, and walking around his garden at Chartwell in Kent, which some of you may have visited. Above all, he liked painting. One day, a present arrived for me with a rather badly wrapped, and it had a card attached to it, which said, please look after him, your loving grandpapa. In a fever of excitement, I tore off the paper and inside I found a life-size toy bulldog. He had wheels in his paws, and when I pulled him along, his head moved from side to side. I was about five years old. I was enchanted, but puzzled. So I asked my mother why I'd got a present when it wasn't my birthday. She explained that someone had sent him to Grandpapa, and he thought I might like him. I did, but that perplexed me even more. I went to bed that night and pondered on this. The next morning, I set off for school on a mission. I asked my friends, I said, my grandfather's a bulldog, what sort of dog is yours? <laughs> no one admitted to their grandfather being a chihuahua. <laughs> By observing how people behaved when they were with him and how they spoke about him, Little by little, it dawned on me that people thought there was something very special about my mother's father, with whom I spent a lot of time when I was growing up. The first 21 years of my life are full of recollections in which he plays a part. Whatever the mood, my abiding memory is of warmth, affection, and humor. When he was a child, the young Winston, with his brother Jack, in the charge of their nanny, Mrs. Everest, spent long periods of time at Blenheim Palace with their grandparents, the Duke and Duchess of Marlborough. Blenheim is the ancestral home of the Churchill family and the place of young Winston's birth. My brother and I had similar holidays, but on a smaller scale. Any of you who might have been to Blenheim will know it's impossible to do anything not on a smaller scale. It's not quite Versailles, but it's very, very large. We spent our holidays at Chequers, the Prime Minister's country house, like your Camp David, or at Chartwell, my grandparents' country house in Kent. Like our grandfather, we were always accompanied by our wonderful nanny. Churchill described his nanny, Mrs. Everest, like this. He said, my nurse was my confidant. It was to her I poured out all my many troubles. When she died in 1894, he said, I lost my dearest and most intimate friend through the whole of the first 20 years that I had lived. Probably as a direct result of his relationship with Mrs. Everest, he had a great affinity for my nanny. I'm sure she brought back happy memories of his old friend. Both of these strong-minded and independent women would have laid down their lives for their charges without one second's hesitation. During the war, any discussion of defeat in our house was taboo, but that did not stop my nanny thinking and planning. Convinced, no doubt, with very good reason, that if Hitler invaded Britain, his first target would be the entire Churchill family, nanny knew she must be ready. Most people have an image of Winston Churchill. On the 10th of May, 1940, standing on the steps of 10 Downing Street, having just become prime minister, with a cigar in one hand and making a V sign with the other, with snowy white hair 
and not a lot of it. In fact, he was born with bright red hair. My brother and sister and I had all inherited his red hair. How on earth was Nanny going to escape with three carrot-top children? She decided she would dye our hair black and take us to live with her parents, who had a pub in Liverpool. Fortunately, she did not have to put this plan into action. If she had, I know she would have succeeded. Her mantra was, say that you can and you will. It's all in the state of your mind, and that was what I was brought up with. One day, when London was being heavily bombed and our parents were away, she was convinced the house was going to be hit, so she called Downing Street and within moments, an armoured car was there to take us to Chequers. Waiting on the steps was the Prime Minister who greeted us with the words, poor little shelter brats. The Chequers visits in the early 50s, I remember very well. The war had been over for six years and I'd never known life without rationing for food or clothes. In my grandparents' house, there was no Victorian policy of the children being seen and not heard or only speaking when they were spoken to. As soon as we could sit in a proper chair and use a knife and fork, we were at the dining room table regardless of the company. The first Christmas I remember was at Chequers in 1951. Hollywood could not have done better than my grandmother. She was a perfectionist in everything that she did. We had the tallest tree, and the most enormous turkey. Hundreds of beautifully wrapped presents all set out in family groups around the Great Hall, carols and tea parties, and Father Christmas in the shape of either my father or one of my uncles. And we were such dim children, we didn't ever recognize them. And we had crowds who gathered to wish us well at church on Christmas Day. While we celebrated, the country had to still be run. There was a team of secretaries in attendance, pens poised night and day, waiting to take dictation from the Prime Minister dressed in his siren suit. His siren suit was something that he decided to invent for himself when he knew he was going to have to jump out of bed in a hurry when the air raid sirens went off, and he knew it was going to be difficult to get dressed up in all his proper clothes. So he, I think, could almost claim that he invented the first jumpsuit. And he had them in tweed, in grey flannel, and in the evening in jewel-coloured velvet with slippers to match. Family occasions were interspersed with grand events at which, whenever possible, we children were included. It was the coronation that we watched from a balcony in Whitehall, and the excitement when our grandparents' carriage arrived and he wa waved his hat out of the window. We thought he was going to fall out, and we, he thought we were going to fall over, but we all lived to fight another day. Then there was his installation as a Knight of the Garter at St George's Chapel, Windsor, which was very exciting, and he was able to dress up again. He loved fancy dress, in long navy blue velvet robes and a big velvet hat with ostrich feathers. Then there was the lying in state of Queen Mary, the grandmother of our Queen. My sister and I were placed in a window under Big Ben to watch the procession come into Westminster Hall for the lying in state. The next morning, there was a photograph in the newspapers. Two little girls, our heads above the coffin, roaring with laughter. No one had told us that we shouldn't smile or laugh. It was an early lesson not to laugh on a solemn occasion when there's a camera around. Nowadays, there's always a camera around. My grandfather's 80th birthday was a cause for considerable concern in the family. The problem was the portrait, commissioned by the Houses of Parliament, one can only imagine intended to give pleasure. But the rumour was out that it was less than flattering. I remember my parents discussing how on earth he was going to react when he saw it. But whatever the concern, no one was prepared for the painting when it was unveiled. To a horrified gasp from the audience, the recipient observed, with a wry smile and characteristic humour, this is a remarkable example of modern art. <laughs> My grandmother knew what she was going to do with it. She sent the painting straight to the house in the country and asked the gardener to burn it. Once he was out of office, life centred on Chartwell, 
the place that Churchill liked best. He believed a day away from Chartres was a day wasted. After the war, the only people in the world who took Churchill completely for granted were his grandchildren. Even his children were in awe of him. They'd lived through what he called his wilderness years in the 30s, when he was out of office and out of favour and telling the whole world the, the news it did not want to hear, that there was going to be another war. But it was at Chartres that we found him most relaxed. We would visit him in the morning and find him propped up in bed with the newspapers strewn all over the bed, his cat snuggled up by his side, Rufus's poodle running around, and Toby the Bradgerigar swooping in to share the breakfast. He loved any living creatures. Once he was up, we would go for a walk. Accompanied by Rufus, we would set off to feed the fish in the ponds that he had cre created himself. As he threw the food into the pond, the fish, quite naturally, would come up to eat. He would turn to us and say, you see, they know me. We tried it ourselves and discovered they were just as friendly to us. <laughs> then we would go to see the pigs. He used to say, dogs look up to us, cats look down on us, but pigs treat us as equals. I do like pigs, he used to say. <laughs> but the man who would win the Nobel Prize for Literature couldn't think of anything more original to say to the pigs as he scratched their backs than oink, oink. Grandpapa's birthday on the 30th of November was a command performance. We all wanted to be there. Every year there'd be a magnificent cake, his favourite champagne, Paul Roger, sparkling in the glasses, and of course the aroma of good Havana cigars. Cigars were of course the obvious present, and every year I would go with my mother to the cigar shop in St James's Street to buy a single cigar. They would lay out an array for me to choose from. And I honestly thought I was choosing. But I discovered afterwards they were all the same cigar. <laughs> but the excitement is that year he smoked my cigar and I could sit on his knee as he, as he puffed away. My abiding memories of my grandfather are at the dining room table at Chartwell. Here we would gather for elegant and sumptuous meals, every one of which was an occasion. Dressed as usual in his velvet siren suit, he was at his happiest, surrounded by as many members of his family as possible. He'd had rather a bleak childhood, so he wanted to make sure that his family had a cosy one. While my grandfather made sure that the food was perfect, he was not content until everyone had a glass of Paul Roger in front of them. As a result of Winston Churchill's taste for the good things in life, it is on occasion suggested that he consumed more alcohol and smoked more cigars than was good for him. I don't think there's any doubt about that. On one occasion, he was in the House of Commons and the Labour Member of Parliament, Bessie Braddock, came up to him and said, Winston, you're drunk. And he said, and Madam, you are ugly. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, I shall be sober, but you will still be ugly. I've never met anyone who ever told me they saw him seriously the worse off for drink. But he did like to have a large glass of very weak whiskey and soda and a cigar close at hand. The full glass remained untouched for long periods of time and the cigar, having gone out, was what he called dead in the ashtray. On one occasion, he observed, I've taken more out of life, out of alcohol, than alcohol has taken out of me. Thinking of war, he said, I could not live without champagne. In victory, I deserve it. In defeat, I need it. In the spring of 1959, we were all having lunch at Chartres when my grandfather asked my mother if she and I would accompany him on the Onassis yacht that summer in the Mediterranean. I was so excited. I'd hardly ever been away. I was not yet 16. A few weeks later, after I'd been equipped with what seemed like a bridal trousseau, we boarded the Christina in Monte Carlo, ready to embark on the most glamorous holiday imaginable. As we sailed out of the harbour towards France, Italy, Greece and Turkey, the guest list could have come straight out of the pages of an Agatha Christie novel. 
There was the multi-millionaire shipping magnate, Aristotle Onassis, and his beautiful young wife, Tina. Their two young children, Alexander and Christina, all four members of this family, independently one of the other, would come to a tragic end not many years later. There was the diva, Maria Callas, and her extremely boring husband. And there was my grandfather, my grandmother Clementine, my mother Diana, and me. Also, the usual Churchillian entourage, his private secretary, Anthony Montague Brown, and his wife, a bodyguard, a valet, and a lady's maid. The scene was set for an idyllic holiday on the most luxurious yacht in glittering companies. Ari and Tina Onassis were the most attentive hosts. Maria Callas, the most irritating guest. Irritating, that is, to all save one. My grandfather once observed, we are all worms, but I do believe that I am a glow worm. <laughs> Modesty wasn't his second name. It was naturally and generally assumed. It was naturally and generally assumed that, as always, the attention of the world press would be centred on the glow worm. It soon became clear that this was not to be. Jealous of having to share the limelight, Callas decided she would turn it to her advantage. She hired her own personal team of paparazzi to meet us at every stop and to photograph her as near to Churchill as she could get. One day we arrived in the magnificent amphitheatre of Epidaurus and found it absolutely piled high with flowers. This was Callas's natural habitat. And she turned to my mother and said, Oh, Diana, what kind people, what beautiful flowers. But why do you think they're in the shape of a V? She hadn't heard of V for victory, which was my grandfather's permanent sign. I'll never forget the look of fury on her face when my mother said, because, Maria, they're for Papa, not for you. By this time, it was not just callouses, spoilt and ill-mannered behaviour which concerned everyone. I was having a lovely time. I was seeing, acted out before my eyes, the sort of thing that I could only read about in the magazines that were considered unsuitable. A romance was going on day by day. Onassis and Callas had embarked on one of the famous, most famous love affairs of the century. By the end of the cruise, both marriages would be over. But for the time being, the show had to go on. And go on it did. France, Italy, Greece, Turkey, the Bosphorus, and the Dardanelles at dead of night in case memories of World War I upset my grandfather. This was the first of my wonderful holidays with him. I just happened to be an available grandchild of an appropriate age to accompany him to the south of France over the next few years. There I had my first taste of grand hotels, or in fact, hotels of any sort. After the war, we'd had, money was rationed, so we couldn't go on holiday, really, because you only had 50 pounds to spend, so that didn't go very far, even in those days. My bath would be run, my clothes unpacked, and there was always something hang, someone hanging around longing to do something for me. I quite naturally assumed that this was what hotels were all about and decided I'd like to spend a lot of time in the future being pampered in this way. Unsurprisingly, hotels, however good, have never quite come up to my early experiences. These were essentially painting holidays and the warmth of the Mediterranean sun Travelling with Winston Churchill in no way prepared me for the hurly-burly of modern travel. We would drive right up to the aeroplane in our car, which as well as the passengers carried the canvases, the paints and the easels, all the necessary elements of the days ahead. It was only later when I travelled on my own that I realised that the request for no pipe or cigar smoking had been amended to allow my grandfather to puff away on his big cigar. I don't think it would have made a bit of difference because during the war, when he was told he had to wear an oxygen mask in unpressurised aircraft, he agreed on condition they would adapt it so he could smoke his cigar at the same time. <laughs> a posse of French police outriders would escort us from Nice to the border of Monaco, where, with the precision usually associated with the Brigade of Guards who guard our Queen at Buckingham Palace, 
they changed places with the Monagas police. After this ceremonial arrival, we settled down to a time of quiet and peaceful companionships, painting trips, drives and picnics, all of which was lovely. But for me, the very best thing was to have to myself the grandfather the whole world thought they owned. Ever since he got his first pocket money at the age of seven, my grandfather's expenses always exceeded his income. He was therefore most understanding about money. Extraordinary that a man who couldn't manage his own finances was made Chancellor of the Exchequer. But he would often ask me when I went to say goodbye after I'd been staying with him, are you all right for money? And I'd always say I was, and at the same time he would reach into his bedside drawer and draw out a, a, a wad of notes which he would press into my hand. As I thanked him, I would imagine that this was the result of a midnight flip to the casino, which he could get to by going into the lobby of the Hotel de Paris and down into a secret pa passage which went under the square and rose up in the casino so no one knew he'd gone. Painting was his passion, and it was his stress buster. And by the time he died, he had painted more than 500 pictures. Considering he didn't start till he was over 40, and he had a few other things to do in his life, it was amazing he did so many. He, one picture that, he's, that he did in, in Marrakesh after the Casablanca conference, when he'd hijacked President Roosevelt to go with him, he gave to the president. And this was sold about four years ago to Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. I hope it's not going to be split in half in their divorce. I was with him when he put the final brushstroke to one of his last paintings, a dazzling still life of oranges and lemons, an endearing memory of Mediterranean holidays. Whenever I look at it, I hope that he is fulfilling his desire for the afterlife, of which he wrote, when I get to heaven, I want to spend a considerable portion of the first million years painting and get to the bottom of the subject. So I do hope he's up there on his cloud painting away. My friends were always welcomed by my grandparents at Chartwell. After a leisurely day of croquet and tea on the lawn, we would sit down to the usual sumptuous dinner. After the coffee, my grandmother would rise from her chair, catch the eyes of the ladies, and say, shall we leave the men to their brandy and cigars? I will never forget the look of terror on one young man's face who I'd taken to dinner. I was about 18 and he was, I think, 22 when my grandmother did her usual trick and he realized he was going to have to have his first cigar and his first brandy with the most famous man in the world because we were only four for dinner. It all went fine. It transpired by happy chance. He'd just finished his military service in my grandfather's old regiment, so they had a lot to talk about. One day in the summer of 1962, <coughs> the, <coughs> the peace was, sh <coughs> was shattered. Sorry. When, <coughs> when Grandpa fell and broke his hip in Monte Carlo. He didn't want to die on foreign soil, <coughs> which at 88 was a real possibility. As I walked with his secretary, Anthony Montague Brown, to the hospital, Anthony said, you've got to prepare yourself, Celia. He's not going to make it. We arrived at the hospital and there we found him lying in bed, looking incredibly frail, surrounded by more nurses and doctors than you could possibly imagine. They were on a sightseeing tour, clearly. <coughs> he summoned his strength and he dismissed them all. And he turned to Anthony and he said, I want to die in England. You'll make that happen, won't you? Anthony didn't reply for a moment. So he said, promise me, Anthony. So Anthony said, I promise. As we walked back to the hotel, Anthony said, Celia, I fear that that's a promise I'm not going to be able to keep. When we got back to the hotel, he immediately rang 10 Downing Street and the Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, agreed to send a VC-10 RAF ambulance plane to take us home. He was put into the plane on a stretcher bed, which was put on the lift that takes the food up to the aeroplane. 
and the, then wheeled into the stripped down body of the aircraft. <coughs> I sat on a chair and held his hand and hoped and prayed that he would make it. <coughs> I'm so sorry I've got this cough. When we got to Heathrow, he was again lowered on the elevator. He caught sight of a little crowd of distraught-looking airport workers. He looked and he smiled and he gave them a V-sign and they cheered. He looked as though he'd got a burst of adrenaline. He looked so much better and we knew he was going to be all right. He was all right, but never quite the same again. Life continued, but at a much slower pace. We made one final visit to France, otherwise his time was spent between Chartwell and the London House by Hyde Park. I'm sure that any of us here who are old enough remember exactly where we were on the day that President Kennedy died. I was alone with my grandfather and the two of us were having dinner when suddenly a television was placed on the dining room table and we sat and watched it together as the dreadful story unfolded and history was made before our eyes. Tears poured down my grandfather's cheeks as the news came in that the young president was dead. And again at the sight of his beautiful wife, bravely watching the new president being sworn in while wearing her pink bloodstained suit. They seemed young to everyone. But how young they must have seemed to that man approaching his 90th year. On the 30th of November, 1949, his 75th birthday, Churchill said, I am ready to meet my maker. Whether my maker is prepared for the great ordeal of meeting me is another matter. <laughs> 15 years later, we celebrated his 90th birthday. The unspoken thought around the table that that meeting could not be long delayed. Six weeks later, he had a massive stroke and it was clear that the inevitable was about to happen. The country braced itself. The family prepared for the end. The patient slumbered on, his faithful marmalade cat snuggled up at his side. This went on for 10 long days, and every day when I went to visit, that cat was in exactly the same position. It never seemed to move. A few years before, he had predicted that he would die on the anniversary of his father's death. Early on the morning of the 24th of January, 1965, we gathered round his bed to say goodbye. 70 years to the day since his father had died, Winston Churchill slipped imperceptibly away to meet his maker. The machinery of state began to put into action the arrangements for the state funeral that the Queen had ordered for him, and which some years before had been named Operation Hope Not. The whole country was in shock. It seemed to affect everyone, young and old alike. This was no, it was no tragedy. He was more than ready to go, but it just seemed to touch everyone's heart. People came from far and wide and queued for hours along the river and over the bridges to file past the catafalque in Westminster Hall. And they lined the streets for the state funeral. He was taken on a gun carriage, escorted by the marching troops and the mass bands that he liked so much. The men of the family walked behind the coffin and the women rode in the Queen's carriages. My Aunt Sarah has the best words to describe that extraordinary day and the journey from Westminster along the streets of London to St Paul's Cathedral. This is what she wrote. Now we were nearing St Paul's Cathedral. I remember seeing it silhouetted in flames from the roof of the Savoy standing by my father's side all those years ago. We'd been told it was not necessary to curtsy to the Queen and her family. They were already in their seats. For the first time in English history, the monarch waved the president and waited for her humble servant. He loved Chartwell. At one time, both he and my mother had planned to be buried there, next to his poodles, Rufus I and Rufus II. But one day, a few years before, the idea came to him to return to his birthplace. He had survived almost a century, and his thoughts as he wandered around Blenheim that day must have been all-embracing, for he decided to commit his bones to the earth, 
where his father and mother and brother Jack awaited him. The battle hymn of the Republic crashed through the great cathedral as the bombs had crashed around it in 1940. Ghosts, they only live in our desire. It is perhaps our memories that see the fireflies hover over the lake and dance where no human could. He's gone, a barge did come and carry him on. The gull grey sky held, the steel cranes bowed their heads and the Thames ran softly on. He is gone. What is mortal of him lies at Bladen. After all the pomp and ceremony of the state funeral, the faithful servant who had served six monarchs was restored to his family by the side of the Thames. There he began his last journey up the river to the railway station, the cranes dipping their heads all the way. We buried him at Bladen in a tiny country churchyard next to his parents and in sight of Blenheim Palace, where he'd been born, born 90 years and so many adventures before. The first 21 years of my life were spent growing up with my grandfather. The years since, I've spent with him in a very different way. I've traveled through the letters and diaries of his early years. I've retraced his footsteps and sometimes his hoof prints through the forests of Cuba, where he rode with the Spanish forces against the Cuban guerrillas. I've traveled all over South Africa, reliving his thrilling adventures in the Anglo-Boer War. In Morocco, where he insisted on taking President Roosevelt to see the sun going down on the Atlas Mountains. And of course, to the United States, the birthplace of his mother, Jenny Jerome, which he called my other country. I've learned much about the man who, on becoming president, prime minister, said I felt as though I was walking with destiny, that all my past life had been but a preparation for this hour and this trial. I've remind, been reminded of his belief in his destiny. He wrote to his mother when he was 23 and a soldier in India and said, bullets mean nothing to me. I have faith in my star that I'm intended to do something in the world. His courage, both physical and moral, have constantly been in evidence his power of communication and his wicked sense of humour. Without pomposity, his wit dealt with the sort of tricky situation in which leaders sometimes find themselves. He was sitting out in the margins of a wartime conference at the White House when an inebriated GI put his head round the door, and we assume not recognising him, said, hey, fatso, where's the John? <laughs> the Prime Minister replied, turn left in the corridor, and you'll see a door marked gentleman but don't let that deter you. <laughs> he showed how wit and humour are a useful part of the armoury for everyday life. When an opposing speaker in a parliamentary debate noticed that Churchill was apparently dozing, he said, must you fall asleep when I'm, sleep when I'm speaking? To which Churchill replied, without opening his eyes, no, it is purely voluntary. The first woman member of parliament in Britain was an American called Nancy Astor, and she and my grandfather did not get on. And one day she said, Winston, if you're my wife, I would put poison in your coffee. He immediately replied to him, you, if I was your husband, I would drink it. <laughs> one day he, was, he went off on a long journey in 1930 all around North America, ending up in Richmond, Virginia at the governor's mansion there, where the governor was Harry Bird. And I got this story from Harry Bird Jr., the governor's son, who at 14 had the oldest living, oldest memory from the youngest witness. He was 14 when my grandfather went to stay at his parents' house. And he told me how there was, his father adored him, his mother couldn't stand him, particularly because he wanted to change the menus, he wanted to change the meal times. can you blame her? And also, worst of all, he ran around upstairs in his underwear. But she provided him with a state banquet, banquet at which chicken was on the menu. When the butler handed my grandfather the dish and asked him which bit of the bird he would like, he said he'd like some breast. The lady sitting next to him said, Mr. Churchill, in this country we say white meat or dark meat. The next morning she received a little posy of flowers and the card read, please attach this to your white meat.
What would have happened if Winston Churchill had not been called upon to lead his country in its darkest hour? Without him, who, in the words of President Kennedy, on making him an honorary citizen of the United States of America, would have mobilized the English language and sent it into battle? Who else could have offered blood, toil, tears, and sweat to such effect? Without Winston Churchill, the world would be a very different place. I'm going to end with my Aunt Sarah's final tribute to her father and the man I'm proud to have called Grandpapa. Forgive me if I do not cry the day you die. The simplest reason that I know, you said you'd rather have it so, and that I held my head serenely high, remembering the love and glory that we knew. Forgive me if I do not cry the day you die. Forgive me if I do. Thank you. I have a few questions, if I can get back to where the questions are. Here they are. Uh, first of all, about you, when, when did you decide to start writing? It was kind of, and, and how, how far into your life was that? Oh, it was, uh, I was in my late 40s, and I'd had two children very late in life, and I dropped out for you five. You had one at 45, I had one you? at 45. <laughs> and I dropped out for five years just to play babies and had a wonderful time. Best years of my life, fantastic. But the children grew up and so therefore I had to think what I was going to do. And th at that moment I went to have tea with my grandfather's nephew, who was a cousin of mine, and we were good friends. And on the table there was a battered little tin trunk. I, I mean, I was obviously meant to, you couldn't not comment on it because it was so incongruous. So I said, what is that? And he said, well, let's have a look. And we opened it up and it contained my grandfather's childhood letters, his parents' replies, his nanny's letters to him, his great-grandparents' diaries, all sorts of treasures. What a treasure, yeah. It was amazing. So I said to my cousin Peregrine, this is wonderful. Someone should do, do it without one, a single thought. And he said, yes, you do it, and handed me the trunk. So that was very exciting. Um, I then rang my sister and I said, do you know a publisher? Because I don't know any publishers. And she said, yes, yes, you know Nicholas Thompson at Heinem. And, and so I rang him up on Tuesday and he said, you want to write a book, Celia? Well, you better be quick because I'm resigning on Friday. <laughs> on Friday, he signed his last contract for me. So that was wonderful. So it was so exciting. And then you, the books just flowed. Was it easy? Was well, the books didn't flow, but it was a wonderful subject to have. I mean, I, the first one was about the first 20 years of his life. Then I decided to carry on with that. But uh, the best part of the next was his time in South Africa in the Boer War when he was captured and he was considered to have been very heroic and had the most exciting adventures. So I went off with my family for a holiday to launch the book there. And the public relations girl sitting next to me in the car, and I said, how many books have we got here? And she said, 300. So I said, at the party tonight? And she said, no. I said, in Johannesburg? She said, no. I said, you mean in the whole of South Africa? She said, yes. So I thought, I was really quite cross because I thought that was ridiculous. So I went, I went up to the presenter in the television studio where I was doing an interview before this party and said, don't let's talk about a book too boring. Let's try and find any descendants of people who knew Winston Churchill 100 years ago in the Boer War. The presenter thought that was great fun. So um, she put, the, put out this message. And when I got home that night, there were 60 replies. So I decided to stop writing a book for 14 years and to do one just for nine months, which was wonderful. It was called Churchill Wanted Dead or Alive. Yeah, yeah, that's when he became uh, well known, at least in uh, in the UK, right? I mean, he... oh no, that is when he established himself on the international stage for the very first time, really. Until then, he was the precocious son of a famous man, but because he had American mother and this famous father, he made the newspapers on both sides of uh, of, of the Atlantic when he was captured by the Boers after rescuing many, many people who had been ambushed on an armored train. And so he, then he escaped from the prison with a price of 25 pounds on his head, dead or alive, very 
like, like it would have happened here, I think. He was annoyed by that he amount. Was fear, but... Oh, he thought it was a very insulting figure. <laughs> um, but he, he escaped and got back and joined the army and fought for another few, few months. Was he a war correspondent at that time when he, he was, was captured? He was a highly paid war correspondent because he'd resi res re resigned from the army, but then he joined up within the army in South Africa but he also was the war correspondent, so he had the edge on everyone because he was able to be, get every story because he was at the front of the, uh, of the charges. Yeah. Who, who, were, who were some of the most important influences in your grandfather's life? Well, he always had a strong woman beside him at every moment of his life. For the first 20 years, as I told you, he had Mrs. Everest, his nanny, who had a huge influence on him because basically his parents, his mother was very busy with her social life and his father was very busy with his political life and they weren't cruel parents, but they weren't, they weren't what you could call attentive. And home for him was wherever Mrs. Everest was. So it could have been a boarding house by the seaside or it could have been Blenheim Palace, but wherever she was, and she came from Kent and she told him it was the Garden of England and that's why he bought this house, Chartwell in Kent. I mean. She car he carried her with him through his life. And his whole life he had a photograph beside his bed. Well, I've always found having a strong woman at home is important yes, but you've too. Got, I think you've got one too. Yeah, I found a real strong one. Uh, but, uh, so let, let, me, uh, let me ask you some, of, some questions that I find interesting anyway. Uh, have, have, you, have you met many of the uh, royal family? I've met some of them, but I mean, I can't say I'm, yeah, I move in royal circles, no, I haven't. Yeah. I've met the Queen, I've met Prince Philip, I've met the Queen briefly. I met Prince Philip when I went with my father, who was Commonwealth Secretary to Kenya and Zanzibar for independence, and Prince Philip was there with us, so that was really quite fun. Nice folks? Yes, very nice Good. folks. <laughs> Good. What actor most accurately portrays your grandpapa? You mean what characteristic? Well, I just thought the ones, all the movies, oh, movies. where Winston Churchill's Oh, it's very been... difficult to say, but I thought the, the latest one, Darkest Hour, was a brilliant film. And I think that probably does portray him, not how I knew him, because I knew him only in a home yeah. setting. But I think that did. And I feel it was so sad because anyone who's seen that film will remember the very sympathetic secretary who was in it, which I think Lily James played. And that secretary was a great friend of mine. And sadly, she died about two years before that film came out because it would have been so exciting for her to have seen herself as one of the main actors. There's actually a YouTube of you interviewing her that I, I enjoyed. I agree with you. She was terrific. What would your... Um, what would your uh, uh, grandfather think of Brexit? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he'd be... Well, I don't, he, if he'd been in control, he wouldn't have got into that situation. Do you think he would have joined the European <laughs> Union? Well, now, there's arguments on both sides, because both sides claim him for their own. I mean, on one side, he was very keen on Europe, on the other side, he was keen, he didn't want to be subsumed. I mean, he was asked what he wanted, and he said he had to choose between the devil and the, and the deep blue sea. He'd choose the deep blue sea, which I think must mean America. Um, but he wanted to be close to America, and he wanted to be close to Europe, but he didn't want to be in Europe. Yeah. I mean, we've got the magical English Channel between us, which has saved us so many times. Indeed. And so I don't know what he would, what he would do, but I think that he wouldn't have made, got us into this terrible mess in any case. The, uh, you know, we, we don't talk much about Clementine. I mean, you mentioned a strong woman, but, uh, and, the, and they say he, he made proposals to three women before Clementine finally accepted. But talk about your grandmother. What was she like? Yes, but I think the proposals he made were those of a young boy who was, um, I mean, none Foolish. of them were, but none of them were really, well, there was one, he had one real, real love, but I think he was so determined on his career that he, he couldn't yeah. keep up with that. No, she was, she was the great love of his life and she was an amazing woman. And 
I mean, she, I don't, she wasn't, he wasn't easy to live with, and she wasn't that easy to live with, but they, they had a great, a great life together. She supported him. But was she an extrovert, or was she... No, she wasn't, a, she wasn't an extrovert at all, but she was very determined that... But by the time the war came, she was the only person who could tell him what was what. If she thought he was wrong, and I mean, she, she would tell him. On one occasion, she decided to write him a letter. She, they wrote each other lots of letters, because obviously sometimes if you're going to tell someone something and they're not going to like it, they can shut you up before you even got past the first paragraph. So she wrote him a long letter saying that she'd been told that he, she, that he hadn't been very kind and he was in a very stressful time during the war and he, she knew the strain he was under, but he must be very careful the way he behaved with everyone. And that um, I think this was, uh, and she, she got her point across, but she'd have never got it across otherwise. Uh, he, with his command of the English language, his incredible fluency, um, I understand that he was opposed, for example, to the rule that said don't end sentences with a preposition by saying this is nonsense with which I shall not put. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but but I, I didn't know that he actually had a speech impediment. Oh, he was born with a speech impediment. He couldn't pronounce the letter S. And one day he went to a, a doctor in Harley Street and said, I'm going into the army now, but I'm going to go into politics later. I can't spend my whole life avoiding the letter S. And so he never succeeded. I mean, he was told to walk up and down and say, the Spanish ships of war, I see. But he never managed. But this became his trademark during the war. When he was making speeches, everyone knew what he sounded like because of this lisp that he had. So it didn't do him any harm. No, it certainly didn't. Uh the, uh, his education, uh, formal education, was a little spotty, it appears. He said, in fact, uh, uh, that uh, my education was limited only by my schooling. <clears throat> Not real popular in this town, but that's... <laughs> well, I'm sure that wouldn't happen here. But he was very, I mean, he was a bad student, and he loved history and English. And the subjects that mattered then were Latin, Greek, and maths. And he ignored those completely. So therefore, he never passed any exams. And when he got, he, he, when, he, when he was 12, he took the entrance examination for Harrow School. And because his father had decided he wasn't clever enough to go to Eton, so he sent him to Harrow. And he, the, the Latin paper, he, he wrote his name and wrote the date. Then, as he said, somehow an ink blot got on it from I don't know where, and that was the extent of the paper. And he said, with that, showing that extent of knowledge, the headmaster decided that I was worthy of entry into the school. <laughs> it was obviously because he was the son of a famous father. But he did, at the school, there were two masters who saw the point of him. Most people didn't, because he was very precocious. But there was the English master who actually preserved some of his work, which was exceptional. And so and then, he, but he, English was the thing that he said the stupid boys were taught extra English. And that was where he got his English. And so, and now, they, I mean, Harrow, he's the most famous old boy from Harrow, but he didn't leave it with great glory. T tell us what, going back to global politics, tell us what he thought of uh, Stalin. Well, he was, felt that he was obliged to make an alliance with Stalin because um, he had no choice. He didn't like him at all, but he had to. But Stalin, he had a very uneasy time because at the end, when Roosevelt was getting ill, Stalin was manipulating the president to get him to sideline my grandfather. And clearly, Russia and America were much more powerful than Britain. And, but my grandfather felt that he'd held the fort at the beginning when no one came in with him. And this was very unjust, but he, he, did, he was in a very difficult situation. And he, did, he didn't like Stalin at all, and he hated communism. I mean, his greatest regret when he died was that the Berlin Wall was still up and that he hadn't had a good relationship with his father. He actually was the first to use the term Iron Curtain. He was, at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri. Yeah, right here. 
he would be, I, I mean, he seemed to be a person who, I mean, he, he had a lot of ups and downs in politics, but he was in it for his entire career virtually. Oh, yes. uh, what would he think about politics today? Well, he didn't think, he didn't consider himself a politician. If you'd, you'd, if you'd asked him what he was, he'd have said, I'm a writer. But what, did he, what would you think politics today? I think he'd be horrified by the lack of civility between the politicians, between the parties. And I mean, you know, they were always quite rumbustious in the House of Commons, but not rude. And it's really nasty now. It's horrible. He actually started out in the Labour Party. No, he started out in the Conservative Party, then moved to the Liberals, then and then back to the Conservatives. I see. And he, what he was said, he said, I ratted and I re-ratted. <laughs> well, I think he used to say, too, if you're young and don't have a, what was it, if you're young and aren't, aren't liberal, you don't have a heart, and if you're old and you're not conservative, you don't have a brain. Exactly. That was his. That's it. That's quite right. <clears throat> well, we have some more questions here. I want to... Uh, well, talk about the, a little bit, I know you did in your talk, but a little bit about the relationship with Roosevelt. Well, he, they had in fact met years before in the 20s, but not seriously. I think that Roosevelt had come over, but in a junior position. But my grandfather, before he became prime minister, was to a degree wooing Roosevelt. I don't think whether he knew he was going to be prime minister, he couldn't have done, but he knew he'd like to be. But so when he became prime minister, they'd already established a relationship. And I think they had a really good relationship. And I think Roosevelt liked him and my grandfather liked the president very much. Mrs. Roosevelt did not like my grandfather. She thought he was a terribly bad influence and made her husband drink and smoke too much. Well, there's that. Uh, <laughs> did, did, to your knowledge, did your grandfather ever confide in you or that he ever doubted, uh, even privately, that England would emerge victorious in, uh, from World War II? He didn't confide in me that, but I know, I mean, he certainly, the fact of the matter is, <coughs> he certainly must have, he, he had to have doubts because, I mean, it was quite clear we had to, if America hadn't come into the war, we couldn't have won. And if America hadn't come into the war, America wouldn't have had a foothold in Europe. And then, well, we would certainly have been speaking German, and I don't know whether you would have been speaking German too, because who knows what, what mm -hmm. Germany and Jap Japan could have done if, if we hadn't all got together. Another question from the audience is, at one time Churchill was universally credited with saving Western civilization. What do you make of the more recent historical revisionism and criticism of your grandfather? Well, I think that so much has been said in praise of him that now when someone wants to write a book, if they don't criticize, they have to find some, some way to criticize him, otherwise there's nothing much new to say. I mean, writing my books, I tried to write on subjects that no one else had, but it's very difficult to find a new subject. But if you do write a book about Churchill, you know you've got a captive audience. As long as you put Churchill in the title, so many people will buy it. <laughs> That's, do you, um, in your opinion, uh, what, was, what was Churchill's uh, primary source of his inner strength? He wasn't a particularly religious man, was he? No, he wasn't, but he, did, uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't an agnostic he, and he, he, or an atheist. He just, he, he said he'd, uh, he'd done a lot of church when he was a young man and been to many, many weddings and christenings and things. He actually came to my christening in the middle of the war, which I thought was quite, uh, you know, he must have had a lot to do, but he did come. And, but I think that he, he had some feeling. I mean, he, when he got to heaven, he wanted to be painting, so he believed there was a heaven. And I don't, I think he certainly would have believed there was something and been fascinated by it. So what that was, I don't know. He didn't actually go to church with us. My grandmother used to go to church. Yeah, I think he said something like, uh, I'm ready to meet my maker, yes. but I'm not sure my maker's ready That's for the ordeal exactly. of meeting That's me. Right. Uh, of all your grandfather's humorous and clever witticisms, which is your favorite? Um, I didn't show you this question that came from the audience. No, that's a, that's a very, very good question. That's a very good question. 
I don't know, I liked the one I told about the, the white meat very much. I liked that a lot. And I liked it too, because I got it from this lovely Harry Bird Jr. who was, did you ever know him? No. He was such a lovely man. And he, I went to interview him and he just had a fall and he had a great plaster on his head and he was determined to do it. He was just so brave and charming. And so, and, and he told me that story. He'd been flying on the wall when my grandfather had been there. And when my grandfather drove away, his mother said, don't you ever ask that dreadful man here again. <laughs> I think one of my favorites is another Lady Astor story when she said, if I were married to you, I'd poison your coffee. And he said, if I were married to you, I'd drink it. Um, so one of our, one of our attendees uh, wants to know what you think of Oklahoma. Well, I think Oklahoma is wonderful, and I think the Okies are great, and I think this is the most wonderful university. I love it. As I said earlier to when we had a few members of the press I was talking to, that if I had a child of the right age, I'd definitely send them to this university. I think it's a wonderful environment, and the <laughs> students I've met are great. And not to mention the president and his wife, who are just fabulous. Well, yes, there is that as well. <laughs> you, I've said it for you. You don't need to say <laughs> that. You, Modesty you. is always good. Modesty is very good. Our, our Dean of Arts and Sciences would like to know what you think leaders could learn today from your grandfather. Ah, well, they could. Uh, his, the, well, he considered that the first of all human virtues was courage. He said that is the one that controls all the others. And so he was determined to be courageous and, and he was always worried that he wasn't going to be brave. When he went as a soldier in India, instead of choosing a neutral colored horse, he chose a white one so that he'd be noticed when he was being brave. But he, of course, that was the most dangerous thing to do. <laughs> but I think he was courageous and he believed in himself. I think it's very important to believe in yourself. Yeah. Uh, what were your, what, uh, of course, your father was a wonderful painter. I think Picasso said if painting was his profession, he'd make a good living at it. Uh, but what, uh, one of our attendees is interested in uh, what's your favorite painting that your, your grandfather did? Well, he did one lovely one of the goldfish in the pond at Chartwood, which I said we used to go and feed. And I think that probably is one of my favorites. But he really enjoyed, I mean, painting wasn't just that he wanted to paint. It was when he, it was his stress buster. Other people, you know, take a, a drink. Well, he had a drink too. He always had a drink with him when he was painting. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that that was his solace. He just loved it so much. He, and it, because you say, as you say, I mean, he, broke, he built brick walls. He laid brick, he wrote, he painted. And we know all the other public things he did. It seems like he may have been an introvert at, at, at heart. No, I don't think he. Well, I don't think so at all. No, I mean, but socially, he certainly was not at all. He was a very sociable person. I mean, he would always be commanding the the room and all of that. But I think that the painting was something that was that was particularly important to him. I mean, the writing was very important to him, but that wasn't his hobby. That was his profession. That you was, told me when he needed money, he'd just it, start absolutely. writing. My, the, his, his children used to say, we live from pen to mouth. <laughs> um, another, another member of the audience I asked, Winston was quite clairvoyant by all reports. Uh, are there any stories about his ability to see the future? Well, except he knew what Hitler was doing in Germany, but I don't think that was clairvoyance. I think that was because he was sitting at his house in Chartwell and people were coming to see him from across the channel and from Germany and telling him exactly what was happening. I'm not sure. Yeah. I haven't heard that he was clairvoyant. That's the first time I've heard that. Well, good. You so can it's take good, that to from know, Oklahoma. good to learn yeah. something else. I'll look into it. Yeah. Thank you, whoever said that. But, but he did. He, he, he knew what Hitler was long before, apparently, Neville Chamberlain did. Well, yes, but he also had people going from all the government offices in Whitehall telling him what, how ill-prepared we were as well. He knew more than Chamberlain did on every front. So yeah. he would get up to ask a question in the House of Commons, and he'd always, of course, never ask a question when you don't know the answer in that situation. The... Uh, what did uh, Churchill enjoy most about Morocco? 
Well, he used to say he wanted to go on a holiday. A place must be paintable and bathable. <laughs> but he liked that because it, he, liked the, he loved the light. I mean, the places he painted most were the south of France and Morocco. And he loved Morocco. He really, but he used to go there. I mean, he didn't just go and stay for a week. He'd go and spend four or five weeks and he'd take over the floor of a hotel. Some, someone else was always paying. He'd probably have got Time magazine or someone to say that they would write publish something for him and would they pay for him to be in Morocco when he was there so he lived like a king when uh, when we were we were talking earlier in your book Chasing Churchill which I highly recommend along with all your other books but you talk about the uh, the, the time you spent on Aristotle's Onassis's yacht can you share a little of that well I did share a little of it earlier I mean I th we, had, we had an amazing time and my grandfather when we would arrive in a port and I would go to see him, he'd probably be having his breakfast in bed. And he'd say, look out of the window and tell me what you can see. And I knew I had to describe it to a painter. He wanted to know what the colors were and what the light was like and all of that. It was very, it was rather fun. Well, I can tell you that we all think this has been a lot of fun. And uh, I, uh, I wish you good luck with your newest book. Uh, and, um, I, you know, your grandfather, and this would be important for, I think, our, our everyone to know that he had that interesting take on life, because he said the four essentials were hot baths, cold champagne, new peas, and old brandy. Very good. Well, he certainly had quite a lot of those. <laughs> new peas, I'm sure, is what you're referring to. Naturally. Well, he also said the champagne must always be cold and preferably free. <laughs> That's great. Well, I think we've had a wonderful time here, and uh, well, thank I've, you, Burns, I've gone for, through so much. For having uh, me these, here. Well, thank you for being a wonderful a, audience. It's been a complete delight. Well, we'll just award you a degree. How's that? Oh, that would be great. Yeah, Thank you, you need one of those, and we'll just give you, give you one. Well, that's right. That would be good. I've got one already from, well, from Westminster College. Oh, good. Good, good. I don't think I really earned that one. Well, thank all of you. This is a wonderful crowd. It's fantastic that you've turned out this way for this lovely lady, the Dom Celia Sands, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.